Yeah, that's a pretty good bumper when you're clapping for the bumper. And that puts a little stress on me. I got to live up to that bumper. I'm not sure I can pull that off. Anyway, we're glad you're here. Uh, well, today we are, as you noticed from the bumper, we're kicking, kicking, kicking off a brand new sermon series. See, I can't stick. It's too much pressure on the bumper. We are kicking off a brand new ser- sermon series called Redeemed that's going to take us all the way through Easter Sunday. So yeah, so that'll be awesome. But we've got cool stuff coming up before Easter. Next Sunday is Palm Sunday, but it's also our two-year anniversary. Can you believe that? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, you can clap for that too. We're going to just clap. We can clap all the way through my sermon. Whenever I mess up, just clap. That's what we're going to do today. Yeah, there'll be a lot of clapping. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, so we're going to celebrate together just one service at 1030. So if you come at the normal service times, you're going to be either really early or really late. Don't do that. Come at 1030. We're going to worship all together. If you look around, we're going to have to figure out a new way to set up the sanctuary next Sunday so that we can get everybody in here, which is going to be awesome. And then we're going to have lunch together after church. We've got Rudy's Barbecue giving us sandwiches. So we'll do that. And then we've got um, an egg hunt for the kids. We've got all of our local mission partners will be here to celebrate with us. We've got some veterans uh, from downtown from Hearts for Heroes. They're going to be out here. We've also got some single moms and their kids that will be here from uh, Two Lives Changed. We'll also have the executive director of Hope Impact. So we'll have all of our local mission partners will be here to help us celebrate. You're not going to want to miss that. And then the next week is Easter. We're excited. I can't wait to uh, show you some surprises we have for you on that Sunday. But here's what you can do. Invite, invite, invite. Between now and then, it really can make a big difference because people are more willing to give, you know, uh, church a chance on Easter Sunday because maybe they grew up going to Easter. It just feels traditional to them. So if you invite them to church, they're more likely to come. So invite friends, family members, coworkers, people you don't know very well, even people you don't like very well because they may well come to church with you. And it really can be the difference between where they spend eternity. It's that important. Another way you can help us out is you can share and like social media stuff. I know that seems kind of goofy, but it works. We've had a number of guests that have come the first time the last few weeks because they've seen about us on social media. So here's how it works. If you share our stuff, that lets more people know. But that actually doesn't do as good a job as if you share it with a personal comment and say, invite, love to have you come, or that, you know, with great sermon, whatever it might be, whatever you would say. And then also like and love other people's shares, because what that does is that tells the the weird Facebook thing to to spread it even wider, because it tells them that people are excited about the information that's in that share. All right, and then one other thing, on Good Friday, uh, which is April the 7th, at 7 o'clock, we're going to have a prayer and worship night. We're going to all get together. We don't know where yet. It's probably here, but we're still working out details. We'll let you know, but if you missed our last prayer and worship night, boy, you missed a good time. Yeah, it was praise. We had 50 people praise and worship. There were tears. You could really just feel the presence of God as we did that. So we're going to come together on Good Friday. We're going to pray and get ready for Easter. All right. Well, if you have your Bibles, your Bible apps, go ahead and open those up to John chapter 10. So for the next three weeks, we're going to be leading up to Easter. This week, we're going to talk about what Jesus says about who he is and what he came to do. And then next week, we'll walk through the the trial and the crucifixion of Jesus And then on Easter Sunday, we're going to throw you a real curveball, and we're going to talk about the resurrection of Jesus and surprise you with that. Well, let's get started. In John chapter 10, Jesus is preaching to some Pharisees and to some other people, but to really understand what's going on here in John chapter 10, you've got to back up a chapter and go to John chapter 9. In John chapter 9, Jesus heals a man who was blind. But he does it on the Sabbath. And the Pharisees are all upset because Jesus has worked on the Sabbath. That was their day of rest. And so they had all these different rules about what you could do and shouldn't do on the Sabbath. And apparently healing a man that had been blind since birth was on the naughty list. So they get all upset at Jesus. And as you might expect, Jesus starts to preach. Look at John 10 verses 1 through 10. Jesus says, very truly I tell you Pharisees. So he's talking directly to the Pharisees here. Anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own by name and leads them out. When he's brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. 
But they will never follow a stranger, in fact. They'll run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Who enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to kill and steal and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. So Jesus is now talking about being the gate. And when he talked about that, the gate for the sheep, his listeners would have understood exactly what he was talking about. Here's why. Back in that day, the shepherd would build a pen for the sheep. And it would look something like that, built out of rock or maybe out of wood. But then it would have an opening. And so during the day, the sheep could go in and out and graze out in the pastures. But at night, the shepherd would literally lay down in that opening. And he became the gate for the sheep. So if a wild animal wanted to get to the sheep, they had to go through the shepherd. If a robber or a thief wanted to get to the sheep, they had to go through the shepherd. But in verse 1, Jesus says, sometimes things will try to crawl over the fence to get to the sheep. And he says, when they do that, they're a thief and a robber because people that are supposed to be there enter through the gate. And and so what we're seeing here (laughs) is Jesus is taking a tough tact with Pharisees. He's going after them. What's he telling them? You guys are robbers and thieves because you're trying to keep people from going through me, the shepherd, as the gate. And boy, they didn't like that. But what they liked even less was what Jesus said in verses 9 and 10. Look at this again. He says, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Jesus here is saying that he is God and he's the way to salvation. Now, to understand this, you've got to understand that in the Old Testament, God would sometimes refer to himself as the I am. In Exodus chapter 3, Moses is arguing with God. He doesn't want to have to lead the Israelites out of Egypt, so he's arguing with God. He's got all these different excuses. But then at some point he says, God, who am I supposed to tell the Israelites sent me? When they say, why are you here wanting to lead us? Who am I supposed to say sent me? And I love what God says. Here's what he says in Exodus 3, 14. He says, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. So you see God calling himself I am here. And then Jesus says this same thing. He says, I am the gate. And if you look back at the original Greek, there's no question about what Jesus was saying. He was making it very clear that he is God. And that didn't go over very well with the Pharisees. And at first we think, you know, those silly Pharisees, always getting upset at Jesus. But let's give the Pharisees a little credit here for just a minute. Think about what Jesus was saying. First of all, Jesus is saying, I am God in the flesh, equal to God the Father. But he's also upending about 1,400 years of the way they thought about religion. Because in that day, the priests would sacrifice animals to temporarily basically pay the price of the people's sin. And they had all these different rules in the Old Testament that they followed. And Jesus is saying in that one moment, all that has changed. You now get to salvation. You now get to heaven through me. I am the gate. I am the way to righteousness. And and so suddenly all of that changed. And we're now saved by grace from God through our faith. And, And so understand, this was a big claim. This would have been This would have been scandalous almost. It would have been outrageous. It would have been a new way of thinking about salvation and redemption. And the Pharisees didn't like it. And the reality is, even today, some of us don't like the implications and the truth of this statement. I am the gate. We we don't like this idea that Jesus is the only way to get to heaven. In fact, you still can see some bumper stickers around that say coexist. You've seen those with the, they have the cross and all the different religious symbols that make it up. But let's be very clear. Jesus would not have had that bumper sticker on his donkey. If he had a bumper sticker on the back of his donkey, it would have said, follow me. Now, if you think about the bumper sticker on the back of a donkey, there's some funny jokes we could make about that. <laughs> Don't go there. We're, 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 we're not doing that. Don't even let your mind think about it. But I want to break down this I am statement because you really got to understand every word of I am the gate 
to fully understand the implications of what Jesus is saying. All right, well, the first word in I am the gate is I. I am the gate. Jesus is not saying he knows the way to salvation. Jesus is saying he is the way to salvation. And that's very different. He is the foundational truth of Christianity. He is the foundational truth of what we believe. Christianity is unique among world religions in that in most religions, you can take the founder out of the religion and it still makes sense. For instance, you can take Buddha out of Buddhism and it still makes sense. It still works. You can even take Muhammad out of Islam and it still works. But you can't take Jesus out of Christianity because he's not just the founder of our religion. He is also the God of our faith. You see the difference? And, and, and so what we need to understand is that Christianity wasn't founded by a mere man telling us how to get to God. Instead, it was founded by God giving us a way to get to himself. And that difference changes everything. Jesus is the core of Christianity. And it's summed up with this word I here. I am the gate. Your entire understanding of Christianity is founded on what you believe about Jesus. Now, the reality is this. Look, pretty much everybody believes in Jesus Muslims believe in Jesus. They believe that he was a great prophet. In fact, he was the second greatest prophet behind Muhammad. Jewish people believe in Jesus. They believe that he was a false prophet, that he was a false messiah. Even most atheists believe in Jesus. They believe that he was a very good man, a good teacher. But what separates Christianity is that we believe that he is more than just a good man, more than just a good teacher, that he is God in the flesh. And that difference changes everything. Our God came to earth, he lived among us, he died to save us, and then he rose from the dead and was seen by hundreds of people after he rose from the dead. This is a big deal. The the New Testament is actually a historical account of Jesus' life, his death, and his resurrection. Now, obviously the New Testament is much more than a history book, but it is in fact a history book. And you need to understand that there are multiple accounts by different writers about Jesus' life, his death, and even his resurrection, that he is God, and that hundreds of people saw him risen from the dead. But what's more amazing to me is that there were a lot of non-Christian, non-Bible sources that also talk about Jesus, that historically record details about his life and his death. Some of those by people that hated Jesus and didn't like Christians very much. Let's look at a couple of those. The first is by a guy named Tacitus. Tacitus was a Roman historian, and this is written about 64 AD, so only about 30 years after Jesus rose from the dead, and he is explaining how the emperor Nero in Rome was trying to blame the Christians for the big fire that destroyed a lot of the city of Rome. Here's what he says. Nero fastened the guilt on a class hated for their abominations called Christians by the populace. Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of Pontius Pilate. And a most mischievous superstition, thus checked for the moment, again broke out, not only in Judea, the first source of the evil, but even in Rome. Now, it's clear here, Tacitus does not like Jesus, and he does not like Christians. He calls them an evil. But there are some important things that he says that match up with what's said about Jesus in the Bible. That Jesus lived that he was called Christ, that he was sentenced to death by Pontius Pilate, and that he was killed. And then he talks about this mischievous superstition. What's he talking about there? He's saying that the Christians, the followers of Jesus, said that Jesus rose from the dead and that he was, in fact, God in the flesh. And that that had spread not just in the area of Jerusalem, but had gotten all the way down to Rome by this point, just 30 years after Jesus rose from the dead. Now, there's another account by a guy named Josephus, and let's look at that. This guy's name's Flavius Josephus. He is a Jewish historian for the uh, Roman emperor Domitus. This was written about 60 years after Jesus rose from the dead. And here's what he said. At this time, the time of Pilate, there was a wise man who was called Jesus. His conduct was good, and he was known to be virtuous. And many people from among the Jews and other nations became his disciples. Pilate condemned him to be crucified and to die. But those who had become his disciples did not abandon his discipleship. They reported that he had appeared to them three days after his crucifixion and that he was fully alive. Now, Josephus was not a Christian. He didn't dislike Christianity, but he wasn't a fan of Christianity. 
And what does he tell us? That his followers said, this dude rose from the dead. Jesus rose from the dead three days later. But my favorite account is another one by Josephus. Let's look at this. He's talking here about how the half-brother of Jesus, a guy named James, was convicted to be stoned because he was preaching and teaching that Jesus was God and rose from the dead. Here's what he says. Festus was now dead and Albinus was but upon the road. So he, he's talking about Ananus the high priest, assembled the Sanhedrin of the judges and brought before them the brother of Jesus, who was called Christ, whose name was James and some others, who were some of his companions. And when he had formed an accusation against them as breakers of the law, he delivered them to be stoned. Here's what he's saying. He's saying that James, the brother of Jesus, was out telling people that Jesus rose from the dead and that he is the Messiah, God in the flesh. Why is that a big deal? Well, we know from the Bible that James and Jesus' other brothers, they didn't believe he was God until he rose from the dead. When he rose from the dead, they're like, okay, we're all in on this. That changes things. And then James was killed for preaching and teaching about Jesus and who he was. Why is that such a big deal? Here's the biggest, the big deal. The most powerful evidence we have for Jesus being the I am, God in the flesh who rose from the dead, is that 10 of the 12 apostles died for preaching and teaching about Jesus. They were killed. Why does that matter? Think about this. What did those disciples do when Jesus was crucified and before he was resurrected? They hid. The Bible tells us that they were in an upper room with the door locked. They were scared they were going to get arrested too. But suddenly, a few days later, they're out telling everybody they see that Jesus is God and that he rose from the dead. What changed? They saw a risen Savior. It's what caused them to go from being scaredy cats to being lions of the faith. They had now seen the Jesus who claimed to be the I am become the I am by walking out of his own tomb. And that changed everything. Because now... They understood that there is a heaven, and Jesus is the way to get there. It's a big deal. Look, these guys had no reason to preach a lie about Jesus. It didn't get them fame. It didn't get them fortune. Instead, it got them beaten. It got them jailed, and it got them killed. But they did it anyway because they knew the truth that they had seen. They were willing to die for the Jesus that they saw come back to life. Let's be honest. Anybody can die for their religious belief. We can choose to die for something. It can either be right or wrong. A Muslim person can choose to die for their religious belief, and that belief can be right or wrong. I can choose to die for my belief in Jesus, and that belief can either be right or wrong. But what these disciples did was very different. They didn't die for a belief that can be right or wrong. They died for a truth that they saw with their own eyes. Do you see the difference? They saw Jesus be crucified on a cross. They saw him buried in a tomb. And then they saw him rise from the dead three days later. And after that, they would go to their deaths before they would deny this truth. If you look at the historical evidence that supports that Jesus is who he says he is and that he rose from the dead, the actual historical evidence and eyewitness accounts is so powerful that if you really examine it, it actually takes more faith to remain an atheist than it does to believe that Jesus is God. And and I would challenge you, if you're struggling in this area, if you've got a doubt in this area, it's okay to have doubts, but don't just sit on your doubt. Investigate the evidence. Let me give you three different books that you can read that I think are really good at showing the historical truth of who Jesus is. One is Not Enough Faith to Be an Atheist by a guy named Norman Geisler. The next is The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel. And the last is Evidence that Demands a Verdict by Josh McDowell. Look, it's okay to have doubts, but go investigate. Find out the truth. Look for the evidence. Our God left heaven, came to earth, lived, was killed, rose from the dead, and lots of people saw and wrote about all of that stuff happening. No other religion has that. Look, there are lots of people over history that have claimed to be gods or be divine. Egyptian pharaohs claim to be descendants of heaven. Chinese and Japanese emperors claim to be sons of heaven. Uh, even the, the Roman emperors eventually began to claim that they were divine. But you know what went wrong with their claim to be divine? They died and they stayed dead. 
just like everybody else. What was different about Jesus, who was a carpenter, who never had great wealth, never had great influence that came from his position he was born into? What was different about him is that when he walked out of his own tomb, he proved that he was God. He proved in that moment that he is the I am. And look, if all these other people that, are, that have claimed to be divine, if we remember them at all, we remember them by the calendar that was created by Jesus' life. Either B.C., before Christ, or A.D., Anno Domine, the year of our Lord. That's how we remember everybody else. Jesus wasn't born into royalty. He didn't have great wealth. He wasn't born into influence, and yet he changed and turned the world upside down. Why did he do that? Because he backed up his claim to be divine by rising from the dead. Jesus made Christianity unique. Other religious leaders would say, follow me and I'll, I'll show you the light. But Jesus says, I am the light. Other religious leaders would say, follow me and I'll show you truth. But Jesus says, I am truth. Other religious leaders say, follow me and I'll show you the way to heaven. But Jesus says, I am the way to heaven. The I is so important to understanding the profound statement that Jesus makes, I am the gate. All right, let's look at the second word in the statement, I am the gate. That word is, in the Greek, has a tense that means it is before and after. It's, in other words, it's not just right now, but it's existing. So what Jesus is saying is that he was, is, and always will be. Jesus is saying, I'm the I am. I was there at the very beginning. Look at how the Apostle John says this in John 1, 1 through 5. He says, in the beginning was the Word. Now he's calling Jesus the Word here. And he says, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the very beginning. Through, through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So John is saying that Jesus was there at the very beginning, but let's look at the very end. Let's look at the book of Revelation that talks about the very end of time when Jesus returns. This is what Jesus says about himself in Revelation twenty two thirteen. 13. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. In this statement, Jesus is saying, I was, I am, and I always will be Lord of all. It's a huge statement. This word am is so important to understand who Jesus is. All right, let's look at the next word. It's the word the. Jesus says, I am the gate. He doesn't say I'm one of many gates. He doesn't say I'm one of a few gates. He doesn't even say I'm one of two gates. He says, I am the gate. With this statement, Jesus is saying, I am the only way to righteousness. I am the only way to to heaven. There is no salvation except through Jesus Christ. This may not be politically correct in today's world, but it is truth. Jesus says this same thing a little different way. He's talking to his, to his disciples right before he goes to the cross, and he's telling them he's going to be crucified, and he tells them that one of, them's, one of them's going to betray him. As you can imagine, they're nervous and scared and worried. But look at what Jesus says to them. He says in John 14, 1 through 6, he says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I not have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? And he's talking about heaven here. And he said, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you may also be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. you got to love doubting Thomas. Jesus is saying these words that probably none of them really understood, but I'm guessing all the other disciples are shaking their head because they don't want to look like the only person that doesn't understand what Jesus is saying, so they're all looking around going, yeah, we get it. And then Thomas goes, Jesus, <laughs> none of us have any clue what you're saying. And when he does that, Jesus gets very specific and very direct, and there's no question about what he's saying. He says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. Jesus couldn't be any more clear. He is the one and only way to find forgiveness and salvation. Did you know that the early Christians were actually called followers of the way? 
This is in the New Testament, right after Jesus went back to heaven. They were called followers of the way. Christianity came way later. They were followers of the way. They weren't called followers of one of the many paths to heaven. They weren't called followers of the, I don't know, preferred method, but not necessarily necessary. They were called followers of the way because they were known for believing that Jesus was the only way to eternal life. See, before Jesus, the Jewish people got righteousness through temporary sacrifices that the priests made. They had this big, huge book of law that we now know as the Old Testament, and they, that, that they followed religiously, trying to earn their righteousness with God. And when Jesus came, he upended all that, and he said, I am now the way to righteousness. I am now the way to get to God. No one gets to the Father except through me. But understand what it took for Jesus to accomplish that. Jesus had to leave heaven where he was worshipped and served by angels. He had to come down to become a man where he could suffer injury, he could get sick, he could have problems, and then he had to be mocked, convicted of crimes he never committed, beaten, and crucified to suffer and die on the cross. That's what it took. Ask yourself, why, why would he do that if there were other ways to get to heaven? And remember that not just Jesus died. All of Jesus' closest friends here on earth, they were all killed too for preaching and teaching that Jesus is the way. Think about that. Why would Jesus have gotten all his friends to, to say something that wasn't true that would ultimately get them beaten, imprisoned, and killed? And that's a lot of effort to go through if you can get to heaven another way. That makes sense. There's an old East Texas saying that says, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Jesus fixed it, but at an incredible cost. And here's why. God hates sin. We probably don't talk about that as, enough as a church, and we sure don't think about it enough as individuals. But God hates sin so much that it took Jesus living a perfect life and then suffering and dying on the cross to pay the price of that sin so that we don't have to. I love how Paul says this in Romans 6, 23. He says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I love the fact that Paul calls it wages here. It's like something you've earned. It's something through your work you have earned death. But Jesus paid the price of that death. But it was at a high cost. And why would he have done that if there were other ways? Why would he suffer? Look, there's one God... And there's one way to get to God. That just kind of makes sense. Think about it like this. What if God went over to this group of people and he said, okay, over here, this side, here's how you get to heaven. You just, it's pretty easy. You just have faith in Christ and you get grace. Okay, over here, you got to do all these other things. You've got all these rules you have to follow, all these prayers you have to say. Would it feel very fair to you? No, and it'd be confusing. Just, just imagine if the people in Dallas got an easier way to salvation than we did. They already have God's team, the Dallas Cowboys, why would God do that, right? I'd be upset about that. No, there is one God, and he gave us one way to get to God. Listen to what Peter told the Jewish leaders in the temple about Jesus and how to be saved. This is Acts 4.12. He said, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. When Peter said that, he wasn't trying to not be politically correct. He wasn't trying to be offensive he was just sharing the truth that he had heard from Jesus. And, and so he knew he was upsetting some people. There were a lot of people that did not like hearing that. But he thought it was more important to tell the truth of the gospel so that people be, could be saved than trying to be politically correct or trying to not upset people. And here's the reality for us today. You not sharing your faith because you want to be politically correct and you don't want to upset somebody is way more offensive than you being politically correct. And here's why. If you truly believe that there is a heaven and it's a real place and there's a hell and it's a real place and you don't tell people how to get over here to heaven and not over here, how offensive is that? Now look, I'm not telling you to be a jerk on Facebook. That's what I'm not telling you. I'm not telling you to stand out on a street corner and yell, everybody's going to hell. I'm not telling you that. But I am telling you that it is offensive to not tell people about what Jesus has done for you. 
It's offensive not to invite them to church so that they can hear about this. There's one way to God, and that's Jesus. Now, if you've been around a while uh, and you've heard me preach uh, quite a bit, you've probably heard this illustration before. I've told it a couple of times. I'll use a different illustration when I find one that's as good of showing this point about the one way to get to heaven. When my daughter, Cameron, who's my second, when she was a baby, she had a medical condition called jaundice. And all that means is you've got this buildup of a substance called bilirubin in your blood. It causes your skin and your, the whites of your eyes to become yellow. Now, the bad news about jaundice for infants is it's very serious. If it's untreated, it will ultimately result in brain damage and can even cause death. The good news about baby jaundice is it's real easy to cure. What they do is they take the baby and they put it under a blue light. And so Cameron was so cute as she was laying there for two days with her little sunglasses on. And that blue light causes the bilirubin to be dissolved so it can pass from the body. And so they told us, you just got to do that. We did it. She was cured. Now, we could have said to the doctor, doctor, see that blue light thing? That's your cure? We, we've got a different cure. We, th- we think that's way too easy. We're going to take her home and we're going to scrub her three times a day. And we're going to try to scrub that yellow tint off her skin. And we think it'll get better. The doctor would have said, you're, you're crazy. There's, there's a cure. Here's the cure. We could have said, look, look, doctor, <laughs> that blue light thing, that's your path to the cure? But we've got a different path. We're just going to take her home. We're just going to love on her. We're going to try to treat her really well and see if it just goes away over the next few days. If we'd have done that, the doctor would have called CPS on us. But, but that's not what we did. We listened to the doctor. The doctor said, there's a cure. And we said, great, what is it? Were we being narrow-minded? Were we being somehow offensive when we accepted the one way to the cure? Of course not. We're just listening to the evidence. And we understand the truth. And we gave into that truth. Uh, Lee Strobel, a preacher and Christian author, he says this. We all have a terminal illness called sin. And the reason we cling to Christ is that he has the only cure. We can try to scrub away our sin with good deeds, but it won't work. We can ignore it and hope it goes away, but it won't. We can sincerely think there's another way of curing it, but there isn't. When we turn to Jesus, we're simply acting rationally in light of the evidence. Jesus is God. And he says there's one way to get to heaven, and that's through him. That isn't bigoted. It isn't narrow-minded. It's not offensive. It is simply the truth. The God of the universe gave us one way to get to him. And he used his son, who has impacted history more than any other person in all of human history. The way he gave us, it's not confusing. It's not difficult to understand. It's not hidden. The whole world has just about heard about it now but it is mandatory. All right, the final word in this I am statement by Jesus is the word gate. Jesus says, I am the gate. So the definition of a gate, if you look, it's pretty simple. It's a barrier used to close an opening in a wall, fence, or hedge. And look, there's no easy way to say this. If you're not a follower of Jesus, the gate is closed to you. And, And so when your end comes, whether that's when you die or when Jesus returns, you'll be barred from getting through the gate because Jesus is the gate and you don't follow him. Look, I'd love to stand up here and tell you that everybody ultimately goes to heaven. Can I be honest? I hate preaching about hell. I don't like talking about it. It makes me sad. These are the hardest sermons for me to preach. But the truth of hell isn't my truth. It's Jesus' truth. And he's very clear about how this works. Look at what he says in Matthew 7. 13 through 14. This is Jesus' words again. He says, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. So we see Jesus saying that. We also see another illustration. He talked about it a lot, but there's another illustration he uses, and he, again, is using sheep for the people who are following Jesus. Look what he says there. This is John chapter 25, verses 31 through 33. He says, when the Son of Man, now Jesus often referred to himself as the Son of Man, comes into his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. We have to jump down a few verses to see what happens to the sheep. And it says, then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. 
Those are Jesus' words. There's the reality of the gate that if you don't follow Jesus, you'll be barred from entering the gates of heaven. And ultimately, you will spend eternity in a place called hell. And I wish we didn't have to talk about that. It makes me sad to talk about it, but that's the truth of Jesus. There's only one way to righteousness. That's to follow Jesus, to make him your Lord and Savior, to repent of your sins, and then you be, be baptized. You, you can't get through the gate by having a wife that's a Christian or parents that are Christians. You, you can't get through the gate by being a pretty good person or even a really good person. There's no, not enough good stuff you can do to get through that gate. Jesus is the only way, and that means choosing him in faith and repenting of your sins. Jesus desperately wants us to follow him. The, the early Christians, they were concerned that Jesus hadn't already come back, that it hadn't happened yet. And look at what Peter says. This is in 2 Peter 3.9. He says, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. He's saying, Jesus is waiting on you. He wants us to follow him. But, but at the end of the day, he's not going to make us. He created us to have a choice. And ultimately, he's going to live with the choice that you made. Look, we've talked a lot about what it looks like if you don't enter that gate. But I want to end today about looking at what it looks like when you do go through that gate. Look back at what Jesus says in verses 9 through 10. He says, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Jesus is saying when we follow him, we get this fullness of life. Look, he's not saying that we're not going to have problems or be sick or have people around us suffer. What he's saying is that he will be with us. That when we follow after him, we can find joy even in those circumstances. But when we die, the promise is even greater. Jesus is saying when we die, we get, we get to go to heaven. We get to be with God the Father. We get to see Jesus face to face. We, we get to spend eternity in a place where there's no divorce. There's no cancer treatments. There's no suffering. There's no abuse or neglect. No racism and hate. The Bible says there's not even tears. There'll be more, no more death. That's why we talk about these things. Because there's this incredible promise for us. And we believe that to be true. And this truth of Jesus being the gate is why Easter is so important. Because on Easter, everything changed. It can change you and it can change your eternity. Let's pray.